unfortunately already our last day um, we had a fantastic set of speakers almost 200 sessions in three weeks we'll have a grand finale coming up today at 1700 but now I would be really really happy to introduce you to a number of speakers uh, who will finalize more or less the economics theme of this week in the beginning of the week, we talked about what the crisis did and where we go from here and what the ideas are. And then on Wednesday with Henry Luce and Gower, we discussed on having a message become contagious, creating a narrative uh, surrounding our economic policy and the ideas out there. And uh, today we're going to talk about redesigning our economy with free companies that cannot be bought or sold. What that means, uh, Graham Voigt will explain to us. He is uh, talking to Rory and Jack, and uh, we also have another in featuring uh, Henry Lusengauer in between with a little video. And with that, I will um, hand over to Graham, and uh, please feel free to post any more questions, these videos will all be live still or all be on demand still for the next four weeks. So any more comments, questions on each session page is more than welcome. We hope that the conversation really just started now. With that, I'll hand over to you, Graham. Graham, we... Right, it's now I'm better. off. Mute. There you go. <laughs> Right. So thanks, Sophie. I'm very much an entrepreneur. My focus is on the practical side of getting stuff done. We have with us in the studio today, Jack Reardon, who is a pluralist economist based in the US, and Rory Ridley Duff, who I would say is halfway between a university professor and a pragmatic businessman um, from Sheffield. So between the three of us, we will be covering a number of topics. We'll spend about five minutes each talking and then open up space for dialogue and questions and answers. So I'll kick things off. And Becky, if you could get the presentation live. Thank you. So today's mess is an unintended consequence of a tool that we invented to do an impossible job that society needed done in 1600 to start businesses that cost more than any one man could invest so we created something called the limited company a, the limited company is a social tool to generate the trust that we need in order to attract and bond enough people and their money to start the businesses that society needed. This tool worked extremely well attracting and bonding by multiplying the money invested. But four centuries later, the world has changed just a little, and this tool is causing unintended harmful consequences. So let's hear now from Henry Lewis and Gower on the problems that have come out of using our 400 year old tool. After that, we'll talk about the new tool that we've invented to solve these problems, the free self-governing developmental company. If you could click play on Henry, please. Hi Henry, thank you very much for agreeing to speak to me. The question I have is what are the problems that we are seeing in the world, in the world economy, that need to be solved? I think what we've seen that is that a certain idea about how we run and organize the economy around the world has come to be seen as not working very well for everyone. Uh, that a lot of people feel excluded by the way it works. They feel that it gives opportunities for more powerful people to extract value from them in a way they uh, cannot counteract. That, uh, that the idea of uh, being a house owner as the ultimate that everyone can be is obviously failed, that large swaths of the youth are not able to do that. And the promise of being a consumer has also dulled in that it's become a uh, a series of complex uh, uh, agreements that we sign up to that we find 
don't actually work for us. Uh, so the whole way we work together as a society, the, the, the stories that have been told in the past of how it would work are beginning to seem to be failed, to, to be failing. So that we need new ways, new stories about how we can work together because I think economics is not really about how you allocate resources efficiently, which is how it's believed to be, but actually how you organize yourself as a community to meet people's needs in a way that people feel is fair and within the environmental constraints and provides a level of resilience and certainty to allow us to function and have sense and, uh, and live a good life. And what we've had to date is failing to achieve any of those. And part of that, I think quite a major part of that, is that we have organizational forms that distort us as humans. We're brought up as humans to collaborate as part of a family, to, to think about the whole, to, to work as social beings in a, whole, in a holistic sense, to have ethics and values. And then we suddenly switch, aged 18, into organizations that say, forget all that. The rules of the game here are totally different. We're just about making profit any way we can uh, to satisfy shareholders. Um, so suddenly we're giving the game to play, which is counteract uh, to human nature and actually undermines all the skills and abilities that we've actually gained uh, over the years. And, and actually takes us away, I think, from our own humanity and actually creates a huge amount of unhappiness and disconnect. So we need new organizational forms that are true to us uh, as human beings and allow us to work together to actually create systems and economies that satisfy our needs in a fair and equitable, resilient and sustainable manner. Graham, can you unmute yourself just in case? Right. So let's go back to the presentation. Yes. We've heard from Henry, we need something that is fair. Um, Sophie, you need to go forward two slides. Yep, that's the one. Back. Yep. So we need something that is fair and fit for human beings. We invented the limited company four centuries ago to do the impossible job that our ancestors were facing. We have the power today to completely reinvent it to do our impossible job, which is creating a sustainable circular economy where all life can thrive. One where all three capitals that you see in this diagram are multiplied, financial, human, and environmental. We're long past the point where just multiplying one of them is adequate. To do that, the company needs to have three of its core components updated to deal with today's impossible job. If any one of these three components is missing, it cannot multiply all three capitals. These three components are individual growth of human beings, agility in work tasks, and corporate governance. So if you look now at the first component, the first component is making sure that we have a way of growing people through their work. Most of us in most companies are kept small by the way we work today. The limited company limits ourselves. It limits our effectiveness at work and it limits all of society. We need to have deliberately developmental companies. Imagine what if our work deliberately supported the development of each of us growing to our full potential. Of course, if we are free to grow to our full potential, we're only going to deliver our best work if we also have freedom in how we do our work freedom in how we govern our work, our roles. Especially work in a circular economy, it's far more like riding a bicycle than driving a train, which means that each person must be able to react immediately. Something threatens the balance of that bicycle. 
immediately react when the unexpected happens in a way that quickly regains the balance. Each person must have the authority to change their role definitions, the organization structure, and whatever else they need to optimize their work and their human development. So those are the first two components that you need to have a company that is adequate for a circular economy, self-governing and deliberately developmental. But it can only deliver in a resilient way if there is real trust between all stakeholders in a circular economy. If you could jump to the next slide, Becky. Thanks. Trust is the biggest barrier. Can each and every company in the circle rely on the next company on in the chain? At the very least, know about and influence anything that they might want to change in the company. Be involved in from the beginning in any decision about merger or acquisitions. You can't do that with today's ownership and governance structures. This is a big challenge to create the systemic trust needed for a circular economy. So we need a completely new legal foundation that is based on inclusive governance, including everyone that we trust to govern in a circular economy. Now, the Edelman Trust Barometer has been measuring year on year interesting data on who do we trust the most. And we've now reached a point where the only people that we really trust are people like us, people who have experience of what they're talking about, and coming almost already a distant second in that is the employee. So we need to construct companies where all people like us, for all definitions of like us, and all people with any relevant experience engage in governance, not just the investors as a special narrow stakeholder group. This gives us the third component, the free company, where we give fair shares across multiple stakeholders, fair shares of both power and wealth. This is the free company, the new social tool that we need to do the impossible job of creating a society with an economy in it that works for all. Now, this is actually nothing new. All we're doing is reapplying to companies what we've already done with countries. Once upon a time in countries, only the landowner had any share in the power to govern. And so most of the wealth generated was also shared just amongst the landowners. Then came democracy. All citizens had equal rights. Some countries have moved relatively recently to democracy. Applying this to the free company, fair shares across multiple stakeholders, it does for companies what democracy did for nations a century or two ago. Share the wealth generated and the power to govern to all stakeholders, including any other interdependent companies in the circles of a circular economy. So all companies can benefit from all of the circle and all companies can intergovern for the good of the whole circle. Only then can we have a resilient circular economy with deep trust. So the question that may be springing to many of your minds is, is this just a fantasy that is in dream world and cannot actually take root in reality? Rory, could you say a few things? Give us some examples of companies that are already doing this. Hello, Graham. Good to be with you. Um, I started to study this about uh, 15 years ago. So during my doctorate, I went to Spain and I looked at the Mondragon network of cooperatives. Uh, and what I found there is that uh, anybody who's discovered the Mondragon co-ops um, read first and foremost that they're worker co-ops. 
but actually some of the very important institutions in that network are multi-stakeholder organizations and there's three in particular the bank which is owned by its workers and its customers the university where the members are students staff and supporting organizations and then there is Eroski, which is their retail network. So Eroski has, again, got consumer and worker owners, and they govern together. That convinced me. I took that to heart. Um, and I have spent the last 15 years looking at whether people in the UK and elsewhere have been adopting similar principles. And so through um, my academic career, we've evolved something that we call the fair shares model. And the fair shares model is based on a recognition and integration of four different stakeholders, founders, labor, users and investors. And I can give you four examples of that. These, these are early adopters of the fair shares model, which we um, published in 2013 and we incorporated an association in 2015. The first of these is any share society in the USA. So this is a, an, a platform co-op. It's a, an online site for the sharing economy and the people who've created it are the founders, the people who write the software for the site are the employees or the labor shareholders, then the people who use the site are the users, and then there are some equity investors in that business as well who've helped get it going and support it as it goes along. Um, the second one is an uh, interesting one, it's in Ireland. It's called Resonate, and this is a streaming site for music. So again, you've got people who've set up the business, but the producers here, or the, the people providing the labor, are musicians who are sharing their music through the site, and then music listeners. And the, um, the musicians and the listeners, they join as members, and at the moment they join, they get asked if they'd like to buy investor shares. So um, the, the, the multi-stakeholder nature of the relationships in the organization are actually built into the process of becoming a member. Then there's two others. Um, the third one is the Human Needs Project. This is in uh, near Nairobi. It's a project to literally build communities. Um, so um, the spearhead behind this is an American NGO. They're the founder. But what they want is they want local producers and local users to become members of a cooperative society. So they join the project as labor and user members and then they also want to get money in from the social investment community and the impact investing community so they have a share structure that allows for that outside investment as well as local members and then the last one is your own company Evolutix um, and and you've done some very very interesting things with multiple user groups uh, what's particularly interesting about your model is the way that the founders share of the voting power decreases over time as the user and the labor communities grow so as those communities grow they get a greater share of the voting rights and the uh, the founders voting rights uh, diminish so all all of these are very interesting early adopters of fair shares um, and i'd be happy to take any further questions that any viewers have wonderful thank you very much rory Let's now move on and hear the thoughts of Jack Reardon, a leading pluralist economist, imagining the big picture now. What if all companies were free, self-governing, deliberately developmental companies? What might the economy become if it was made up of companies where all companies were like this? What are your thoughts on that, Jack? You're on mute. Actually, there we go. Um, good morning. It's really, really nice to be with both of you. And it's, it's. I, I mentioned the morning. It's morning in uh, the USA. Um, I've been actually working on this. This has been my life's mission to do something different about economics and economics education to re-educate, reconceptualize. And I know we have a long way to go, but I'm very optimistic. I'm optimistic listening, and I'm optimistic listening to our other speakers. In 1890, Alfred Marshall wrote in his best-selling Principles of Economics book, he said, every generation must look at its own difficult situation. And our situation is difficult. Our institutions aren't working. Our economic system isn't working. And there is a failure of imagination. 
And I think imagination is very, very crucial. This is something that we need. This is something that we need in order to make our institutions work. And if we look at economics, what is economics all about? It's about provision. And if, if, if economics isn't able or our systems aren't able to provision, if our institutions aren't working, if our institutions aren't able to allow us to provision, then we need to sit down and ask, what's the matter? And are there institutions that we can introduce that will make us uh, provision uh, for everybody rather than just a few people? And I do believe if we implement uh, the suggestions that were uh, recently made by the recent speakers, this will go a long way, and we need to do this. Um, in, uh, uh, in 1980, Joan Robinson wrote a really good book, What Are the Questions? And she basically asked, uh, she suggested rather than looking at the answers, we need to produce the questions, and our questions are very critical. And one of the crucial ones is, what if? What if our system looked like this? If it did, economics would need to be radically reconceptualized. Economics, as it is right now, is wedded, is slavery. Uh, it is, it, excuse me, economics is wedded to the 19th century conception of producing wealth, of, of provisioning for a select few. And this, this, this is this has given us or putting us on a collision course with the environment. And we need, we actually need a burst of imagination. Economics needs needs to move forward. It needs to be more progressive, and it needs to be looking at what is the best way of provision. I think that's really the crucial word: is provision. This is is all about. This is what's missing right now. And I do believe if every business were to adopt um, these suggestions, economics would be very, very different. But we, there's a long way to go. Right now, we look at very many obstacles and vested interests that are preventing us from incorporating uh, these greater ideals. And maybe, maybe just to wrap up, I think we have to ask, what's the best way of moving forward? What's the best way of recognizing the vested interests and the obstacles that are preventing us from adopting each of these suggestions? And what is, what's preventing us and also economics education from um, adopting? And we basically need a burst of imagination, but I'm very, very optimistic. It isn't just me. It, it's lots of other people around the world and there's a coalescence of this effort uh, to do something different. And I am very optimistic with a new generation, economics will look uh, completely different, but this doesn't just happen. This uh, necessitates a really good concerted effort amongst all of us. And maybe after we listen to this, or after we produce this, maybe this should be our number one objective. What can we do to either understand or implement? Each of these are very crucial. Great. Thank you, Jack. Sophie, do we have any questions coming in from the audience? Hi, Graham. Thanks, thanks everyone, for this great presentation and input, um, as well as the video. Um, there, there are some questions, and I think this is a topic we could probably talk about for days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All of you will agree. So one of it um, yes. that I will start with is probably because Jack just talked about it, and it's a good segue to lead on from this, the barriers. And I think when we talk about the type of structure, Graham, you suggest, how do we remove legal impediments and how can we move forward in terms of investor interest? I'll pick up on the legal impediments briefly. I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago one of the participants was part of the UK civil service responsible for business competition and so on. And he said to me at the end, Graham, I sit in lots of talks that are about how we make the world a better place. Yours is the first one that has not ended with a request for different policy or different law. Everything that we are talking about can be done within existing law. Uh, Rory, do you want to say a couple of comments? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I think it, um, it varies internationally, but in the UK, 
when you create a new company, you can just tick a box that says bespoke rules and you can write your own rules. So anybody who's creating a new uh, company in, in our culture, and this is true of some of the other Anglo-American cultures, can choose to use bespoke rules. Um, and that fits very well with fair shares because basically we've got alternative bespoke rules, if you like, that you can use for this multi-stakeholder organizing. So we can make it, we can make it easy for you. Um, you don't have to write them for yourself. You can just start from a template that we've created and adapted. Um, it's a little bit more difficult in, in other European countries where there is slightly more rigidity, but we're, we're engaged with multiple partners. We have a project that covers Hungary, Croatia, Germany, the Netherlands and the UK. And we will be working out over the next uh, year and a half how we can adapt it to those cultures as well. Thank you, Rory. The other thing I'll pick up on, Sophie, is the other part. What about the vested interests? Mm. Well, one of the things that I learned in the transition in South Africa is that if you want to have a transition to a new future where you retain all of the wealth of the current system and you make that transition in a sufficiently smooth and peaceful way that you don't destroy anything unnecessarily, it's critically important that you can offer immediately something that is actually more attractive than the alternatives to the people who have power. And that's one of the things that was part of our initial thinking in designing a fair shares multi-stakeholder company. If it is has all three elements in it, it develops people, it's self-governing, and it's fair shares, companies like that have a significantly lower risk of failing at the startup stage a significantly lower risk of failing when they're mature businesses because they are far more agile and all individuals are completely motivated to put all of their discretionary effort in. It brings together the best of, let's say, the open source software movement together with the best of investor-backed capitalism. And in that sense, our bet, and we're working towards setting up proof that this bet works but our bet is that an investor who invests in a free self-governing developmental company will on average have significantly better financial return on investment than investing in a traditional limited company so in that sense we're offering something better than what we already have to the investors and to all of the other stakeholders Great, fantastic answer, everyone included. Um, there is another big question that came up from the website. Uh, it didn't catch the name, let me just quickly check. Eric, so Eric is asking just four minutes ago, should we not also identify another way to measure value as everything is now expressed in dollar terms, pounds or euros or whatever currency? The definition of value is much more than only money. Co completely agree and that's very much at the heart of what we're doing when we talk about a company as a multiplier of capitals human capital environmental capital financial capital to do that we need to have ways of measuring all three of those capitals and if there's something where we can't measure but we simply say this is something we value it is valuable to us, then that is also part of the whole game. And that that's part of, maybe Rory, you want to say a few things about this, but the very essence of the fair shares legal structure enables you to legally embed into the company all of the different things that you value, not just the financial, and put them onto an equitable footing. Um, I think there are two two comments I'd like to make. One is, um, you're quite right, that one of our members of the Fair Shares Association, Maureen McCulloch, she, she made a contribution to uh, the Institute of Accounting, uh, the ICAEW in the UK. She, she mentions that it's about rewarding the type of capital contribution you make. So Fair Shares is structured to reward people who contribute their social capital 
reward people who contribute their intellectual and human capital, as well as those people who in, you know invest their financial capital. So the, the corporate structure itself is designed to pay dividends on the basis of different types of capital contribution. So that's, that means that you're already measuring contributions in a different way. But I think it's worth drawing attention to the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals of the United Nations, because they are a framework for looking at value creation. And they provide a whole series of targets that we can use to benchmark organizations. And we can reward those companies on the basis of their achievement of Sustainable Development Goals rather than their achievement of financial profits. I think Jack, uh, I think Jack would probably want to say something on that too, I imagine. Yeah. You're on mute. Uh, yes, uh, there we go. I, I, I look at this as something that is very, very crucial. I think what Eric was actually getting at, uh, maybe indirectly, is you know, traditional economics, we've had GDP. So this, is, this is a notion constructed during the 1930s for a different age, for a different set of issues. And looking at, um, at least since 2015, as Rory mentioned, with the, um, the publication of the 2000, uh, excuse me, the 17 United Nations Development Goals, we need a different, and, and I think when I look at value, I don't look at value in dollars or pounds or euros, but I look at value is, is a person able to reach his or her development? And yes, that's subjective, but it's it's also subject it's also suggesting that value is related to the potential of the individual, and it's also related to the institutions that are able to provide uh, that development and the economic system. And we need a reconceptualization of the word value. But if we look at the history of economics, this is one of the most maybe subjective, maybe one of the most divisive uh, issues. It's a multifaceted concept, but I think it's at the root of uh, what we're talking about. And it's, it's very crucial we latch onto this. Excellent. Thanks, Jack. A, a thought there. You know, if, if we think that um, business is a subset of society, which is a subset of the planet's environment, and economics is an even smaller subset of all of that, it strikes me that economics has probably been limited in just the same way that the traditional company form has limited human beings in society, especially in today's world. Do you have any thoughts on what needs to change, perhaps in how economists are trained and in the econo economics profession in order for economists and economics to, to grow to a sufficiently high level of um, development that they can fully embrace the economics of a free company that is self-governing and deliberately <laughs> developmental. Maybe we need to have deliberately developed yes, uh, economics programs. Yeah, yeah. Well, th this this is a great question, and this uh, I could maybe take the rest of the week to answer it. It's a very very crucial question. And let me let me just begin by earmarking one particular word. You use the word subset. I don't know if I would use that word. I like to use the word interrelated. And maybe using the word subset, that's maybe conceptualizes a two-dimensional, maybe Newtonian way of looking at economics and the economic system. But I look at these as interrelated. And right now, the difference with economics as it was and as it needs to be is that economics is wedded to this 19th century way of thinking. And I've been arguing very, very consistently that economics needs to open up. It needs to open up to other disciplines, sociology, history. And as you and I have conversed a lot, physics, the new physics. And we're working right now, uh, rethinking economics and other global movements. What's the best way of reconceptualizing economics education in order to dialogue, in order to listen? And maybe this is one thing we should be educating is what's, what's the best way of teaching us how to listen and to dialogue? Mm. We learn by listening. We learn by dialogue. And we don't learn by exhorting or preaching. And maybe this is the most basic factor. Uh, what's the best way to, to teach 
members of economics profession or future economics uh, professors or policy, what's the best way to listen? What's the best way to dialogue? Economics isn't the only answer. Our difficulties are not just economic. They're, they're physical, they're sociological, they're historical. And we need a multiplicity of thinking and, and disciplines. And I also think the the archaic uh, 19th century different uh, different um, dialogues, different uh, ways of thinking that are isolated, this no longer works. And just to bring back something Rory mentioned, if we look at the 17 United Nations Development Goals, this is implicit and explicit. Great, thank you, Jack. Maybe picking up on the importance of dialogue across multiple different types of people. Let's put that into practice here. Sophie, do we have any more questions? <laughs> yes, actually, uh, uh, that will be probably coming from me. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I will, um, I'd be interested because we, we did hear at the diff here about B corporations mm -hmm. and, um, you know, sort of other types of certifications of companies establishing some sort of value or purpose. Um, is that running in alignment to what you're suggesting? Uh, how can we combine this? Is there a way, you know, to, to have a uh, holacracy or have the, the fair shares uh, multi-stakeholder uh, organization running, you know, in, in combination with that development or movement? Yeah. Shall I comment, Claire? Please do. Um, I, I would say alignment is entirely possible. We, we had a very vigorous debate online about whether fair shares should be used alongside B Corp because one of the members wanted to create a cooperative in Canada that also embedded B Corp principles. And um, I certainly encouraged him to, to go down that line because B Corp asks for multi-stakeholder design as part of the, the criteria for success as well as um, social mission and auditing, and these are all very well aligned with with parts of the fair shares model. But there there are lots of um, people working on this. There, we, in the UK, we have community interest companies. In many parts of Europe, they have a new form of social cooperative, many of which are, are multi-stakeholder by design. Um, they they came from Italy, where the multi-stakeholder model is very well established as well. So there's there's numerous legislative efforts to push people towards a more social orientation and even a more multi-stakeholder orientation. And B Corps is, is, is part of that, yes. I'll pick up on two things in what you've said, Sophie. Um, I think that not only is it compatible, but it's actually essential if we're going to have a resilient economy, especially resilient circular economy. If I take the B Corps, that's a certification. It doesn't go deeper into, it doesn't anchor it deeper into the organization than the, the board, yeah. day by day willingness of the people in power to maintain the certification. So you could have a B Corp that is still owned completely by the two founders. And the two founders reach a point where they say they want to cash in. They sell the entire company on Friday afternoon to some, let's say a private equity house. Monday morning you arrive at work, the private equity house has put in a completely new management team, turn it into a traditional company and the whole B Corp gets jettisoned. Mm. Equally with Holacracy, there's a friend of mine who was working in a company that ran on Holacracy. They had a superb company running brilliantly, and the owners decided it was time to exit, sold the company on a Friday afternoon, in this case, <laughs> the, the deal was signed. The staff knew nothing about it until they arrived at work on Monday morning to discover that they had a new management team in place that immediately imposed a traditional management accountability hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So I would argue that if you're going to have all of the th wonderful things that are emerging, like the self-governing approaches of holacracy, sociocracy, sociocracy 3.0, etc., mm -hmm. all of them are handicapped unless they're 
underpinned by a legal foundation that anchors trust and accountability in across all stakeholders. And even if you have only those two in place, you're still limited unless you put in place the third component of the deliberately developmental organization that really puts onto an equal footing good practice in developing human beings vertically that needs to be on an equal footing to good accounting practices and maintaining the financial health of the organization. And in that sense, um, Olivia B comments on values and being caught in the dilemma. Well, if you have all of these things in place, in essence, you have all stakeholders inside the tent rather than many of the stakeholders outside. And it means that all of the discussion around value happens inside the company, not as a fight between one group of people that has the power to control the company and another group of people that has no power but huge dependency on what the company does. Yeah, I, I, I can actually probably putting up the slides, the last one that you have, Graham, uh, and I thought that was really powerful, eliminating human waste and, uh, you know, what, what can bring out the best of each, in each of us. Um, I think we are, we have three minutes left. <laughs> we are coming close to, to the end of the session. And maybe, maybe in one sentence, all of you could just quickly say what you think where you would see this development going in the next five years so jack would you care to start mute uh my apologies i would just like to quickly add that i mentioned that this is the end of the session but i don't look at this as the end i look at this as the beginning this is what we need we need a global dialogue we need concerted effort i think uh uh, I would just add that there is some urgency. I'm looking out my window right now. This is the upper Midwest. This is November 24th. The grass is green. The leaves are still on the trees a little bit. This, this is very different. I mean, this, this is suggesting that we have to worry about sustainability. And then our, our issues are not pigeonholed, but they're holistic. Great. We should... Rory? Yes, I, I, I would love to see the vision of any chef's society realized so when they create a platform for people to work together they allow buying and selling borrowing gifting renting sharing the point is they're pluralizing the number of economic exchange transactions that are possible and they're putting power back into the hands of ordinary people through a, a web platform to transact with each other in any way that they see fit rather than being confined by this classical economic model and market uh, commodity pricing. And for me, what I'd like to see in five years time is a number of companies all running on the free company legal basis, self-governing and deliberately developmental. And this ecosystem of companies in five years time proving that if you have a system of companies running like that, each company has significantly lower risk than in today's world and performs significantly better on whatever performance measure you're looking at, whether it's financial, human, social, etc. And that in that sense, we go beyond the current debate between for profit or not for profit. Fantastic. That's amazing. I think it really rounds up uh, the discussion we had. And again, and I agree with Jack that it's just a start of a conversation. Uh, we have a lot of comments on the session page. So please keep an eye, all of you, you can log in and answer and keep the conversation going. Um, I think key takeaways were pluralizing the number of economic exchange, management accountability hierarchy there's a couple of words that we might all have to look up but it's reconceptualizing of the word 
value. I think there is a number of things that we all consider in our daily life and daily work structures and we can take away from this session. Uh, this is uh, one of the last sessions, only one more coming up that might be interesting for the audience, which is on Circular Cities with Bjorkvin and also featuring Jamie Butterworth. And then obviously the finale, the grand finale at 1700 GMT. Please stay tuned on the website. All videos will still be watchable on demand and we look forward to hearing more from you. And with that, thanks very much to our panel. Seeing you soon in the future and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.